It's almost impossible to attempt resuscitation if the casualty is still in the car. But try if this is your only option. One and two and three. Your chances of restarting the casualty's heart and breathing are low. But their chance of survival is high if you continue resuscitation and medical assistance arrives quickly. Resuscitation is a skill which cannot be learned from a film. So seriously consider taking part in an approved course to learn that skill. And remember those three minutes. So that's the all important A, B and C. Now let's look at other situations. It's very rare for an accident to involve fire. But if one does and someone is inside a burning car, then clearly they have to take priority. Get people out as quickly as possible and move them as far from the burning vehicle as you can. If someone has burns, the flesh around the burn will swell. If possible, remove anything like jewelry or watches which might cut into the skin as it swells. Cool the jewelry and surrounding skin before attempting to remove it. You can cause significant further damage to the casualty's hands if you try to remove rings in a hurry. So consider whether it would be better to wait for help from trained personnel using special ring cutters. Don't try to remove burnt clothing. Limit pain and tissue damage by cooling the area with lots of clean water or a specialized water gel burns product. You may need to cool the burn for some minutes, but beware of overcooling as this could cause exposure or hypothermia. Then cover the injured area with a clean, dry dressing. Use something that won't stick to the wound. Don't use cotton wool, for instance. Serious burns bring risks of infection, dehydration, and as time goes on, excessive heat loss. Cling film laid on the affected area is good for protecting burns from all three. But make sure you cool the wound first so that the film only prevents loss of body heat by evaporation and doesn't keep in the excessive heat from the burn. If someone is bleeding badly, then apply pressure to the wound after examining it to ensure you do so without causing further damage. Try to raise the injured part and then cover any open wound with a dressing to prevent infection. If the wound is serious, don't waste time removing clothing. Just plug the leak, apply pressure, and elevate. Protect yourself from the risk of infection. Gloves, or even the plastic bag you had your sandwiches in, will provide some protection if you're concerned about AIDS, hepatitis, or any other infection. If you suspect someone has broken bones, let them sit in a position they find most comfortable. Let them support an injured limb themselves, just provide plenty of comfort and reassurance. If the casualty is wearing leathers, leave them on as extra support. But caution, always treat someone who has been injured in a motorsport accident as though they have a spinal injury until it's proved otherwise. Thank you. Right, just stay where you are, that's fine. Do not move them unless they're not breathing or in danger from fire, as they could end up paralyzed. Warning signs of possible spinal injury are pain in the neck or back, pins and needles in arms and legs, or not being able to move limbs. But remember, 50% of spinal injuries are not immediately apparent. If you think someone may have injured their spine, wait for skilled help. Although still be ready to help with resuscitation because spinal injuries can sometimes stop people breathing. Avoid removing a competitor's helmet unless you have to because they're having trouble breathing. Helmet removal and how to remove the helmet of a competitor wearing a hands device are skills discussed in the second part of this video, which is designed for use as part of a practical training session. Keep in mind that after an accident, people are likely to be in shock, so comfort them. Don't grab hold of them. It could provoke an aggressive reaction if they have a head injury. Keep them warm and tell them what's happening. Remember, someone who appears unconscious may still be able to hear what you're saying. Try to note down what you have done to help the casualty.
and any change in their condition, together with the time when you noticed the change. If you saw the accident, try to note down what happened. Your notes could provide vital information for the emergency services when they arrive. Some events pose their own unique first aid problems. In cold conditions, hypothermia may be a problem. If so, try to warm people, but gently. Don't let them smoke. And don't give them drinks, especially alcohol or food, because this could delay important surgery. At the other extreme, the problem may be heat exhaustion or sunstroke. If you're sure that heat is the problem and the dehydration that goes with it, then for heat exhaustion, give plenty of cool fluids. While for sunstroke, cool the body down and get help urgently. If you're traveling weather unusual hazards, get specialist advice before you set off and check what vaccinations or medication may be required. On some events, you may even be faced with water hazards. If someone has nearly drowned, remove them from the water, perform the ABC, airway, breathing and circulation checks described earlier, and start resuscitation if necessary. So to sum up, always think about the dangers to yourself and others. Assess the situation. Summon help at the earliest opportunity. Protect the scene. Rescue the crew if a car is on fire. Remember the three minutes. Understand the ABC. Carry a first aid kit. And keep tetanus and other vaccinations up to date. Finally, consider more formal first aid training. And at the very least, watch this film again in a year or so to remind you of the key points. Part two looks at more advanced techniques which will help you to save lives and prevent further injuries if you come across a motorsport incident. It is intended for more experienced marshals and also for competitors, but may help others with less experience to gain a greater understanding of the issues involved. This film is about first aid in motorsport. It accompanies an introductory video and deals with more advanced issues, such as removing helmets and the hands device, supporting the neck of a competitor with a suspected spinal injury, more advanced techniques for opening an airway which are not now taught as part of a standard first aid course, and how to help casualties in a vehicle that is on its side or its roof. It is aimed at experienced marshals and also competitors and is intended to be used in training sessions where those taking part will have an opportunity to practice these skills under the eye of an experienced trainer. The first priority in any incident is your own safety, followed by the safety of colleagues, competitors and bystanders. Once the dangers have been eliminated or at least reduced to an acceptable level, you assess the responsiveness of the casualties and then shout for help if you are on your own. If you have an unresponsive casualty, you ensure they have an open airway and check their breathing. If a casualty is still wearing a helmet, you should attempt to open their airway by supporting their head in what is known as neutral alignment. That is the normal position the head is in when you are standing or sitting, looking straight forwards. Can you hear me, driver? Tell the casualty what okay, you are doing. Even if they appear to be unconscious, they may still hear and remember what you are saying. So be positive and polite and don't express any views about their condition. It is vital that a rescuer supporting the head is comfortable, as once they begin supporting the head, they must not let go until another rescuer takes control of it. Before the visor is opened and the chin strap released, the best way to support the head is to hold the helmet by placing your hands approximately where the casualty's ears would be. 
Alternatively, you could support the top of the helmet and chin bar. Or if you are on your own, support the chin bar with one hand while you open the visor with the other. Once the visor is open, you can try to assess the casualty's breathing. If there is a problem with the casualty's airway, or they are not breathing and they are wearing a full face helmet, there is little you can do to help them until you remove the helmet. If you want to take the helmet off now. Taking a helmet off normally requires two people who have been trained and have practiced the skill. If you need to remove the helmet, once the visor is open, check to see if the casualty is wearing spectacles and remove them if they are. Then release the chin strap. Try to familiarize yourself with the way chin straps are fastened before you have to undo one in real life. But remember, in an emergency, don't waste time undoing the chin strap. Cut it using scissors. Once the spectacles have been removed and the chin strap undone, the next step is to release the casualty's seat belts and move them out of the way. If the steering wheel can be removed, take it off. This usually involves reaching between the spokes and pulling the retaining collar behind the wheel towards you to release it. Carefully remove the wheel and put it well out of the way. So to recap, if there are two rescuers, the first supports the casualty's helmet, while the second opens the visor and checks the casualty's breathing. If the casualty is breathing and there is no pressing danger, support them where they are and keep monitoring their breathing and response. If there is a problem with the breathing, the second rescuer removes any spectacles, undoes the chin strap and seat belts, moving them out of the way before detaching the steering wheel to create more space. The second rescuer can now take control of the casualty's head. The best way to support the head is from the front. Slipping your hands up under either side of the helmet with the first and second finger of each hand above and below the jawline on either side of the casualty's head. Thumbs on the casualty's cheeks or chin and the other two fingers of each hand around the back of the casualty's neck. Hands devices are increasingly being worn by competitors to protect them against spinal injuries. It is more difficult to support the neck of a casualty who is wearing the hands device but still possible using this technique. Once the second rescuer is confident they have secured the casualty's head and neck, they can tell the first rescuer to release their hold on the helmet. If the casualty is wearing a hands device, the first rescuer must now detach the hands from the helmet. The hands is attached to the helmet by straps with metal catches and secured under the competitor's seat belts, limiting the movement of the head in a crash. Don't try to release the catches which attach the hands to the helmet as this would cause the head to move. Just cut the straps between the helmet and the hands and leave the hands where it is, on the driver's shoulders. If the casualty is in an enclosed cockpit, take a look at the space between the top of their helmet and the roof of the vehicle. Ask yourself if there is enough space to lift the helmet off. The answer could well be no in which case you will have to carefully move the casualty down in their seat to create enough space to remove the helmet. While the second rescuer continues to support the head, the first grips the casualty's race suit by the thighs, lifts and pulls them gently down the seat to create sufficient space. The first rescuer now grasps the chin strap on either side of the helmet or slips their fingers under either side and eases the helmet apart. Keep explaining to the casualty what you are doing as you rotate the helmet backwards so that the chin bar clears the nose and then lift the helmet off. Check the casualty's airway and breathing and commence resuscitation if necessary. If you do need to resuscitate a casualty, you may need to remove the hands device. There are two ways of doing this. The first method involves the rescuer who removed the helmet taking over the job of supporting the casualty's head and neck. Once they have control of the head and neck, the other rescuer rotates the hands device through a quarter turn and slides it off over the casualty's shoulder. Take extreme care as the hand's shoulder support will put pressure on the casualty's throat 
and this procedure will be very uncomfortable for a conscious or semi-conscious casualty. The second method involves the rescuer who removed the helmet sliding the hands device upwards and slightly forwards so that the shoulder supports slip up the back of the neck behind the casualty's ears. Although this method avoids putting pressure on the casualty's throat, it may involve moving them forward slightly so that the hands device does not catch on the back of the seat. Which method you choose will depend on the circumstances and the type of seat involved.